Japan has an epidemic of microcars. And ironically, it's for exactly the same reason that America has an epidemic of SUVs. See, you don't have an SUV in your driveway because you liked it. You have an SUV in your driveway because the government made a series of decisions that made it cheaper and easier for car companies to design, engineer, and manufacture SUVs. So they made them more attractive to you. Terrible fuel economy, not interested. Horrible handling, wait a second, it's cheaper? <laughs> Why, I'll take two. And pretty much everyone has. The same exact thing happened in Japan, just in the opposite direction, encouraging tiny little efficient cars. And in the process, the Japanese government created an entire class of vehicles that people would have otherwise not wanted. And that includes three of the coolest little cars ever made. Okay, so I may have made it sound like you have no free will. That's not entirely true, but in the auto industry, there's a definite order to chicken and egg. And that order is often the reverse of what you think. For example, you may think that a speed limit is a predetermined thing that tells you the rate at which you may drive down a stretch of road. No, not in America at least. Here, a speed limit is determined and then adjusted based on the prevailing speed at which people actually drive on that road. Meaning, if you could just convince people to drive more quickly, you could compel the government to actually raise the speed limit on a section of road. It's the same sort of backwards causality that created the K car. It's not like Japanese society woke up one day and said, hey, you know what would be great? A whole bunch of underpowered cars that are so small we barely fit in them. Mm -mm. The Japanese government created that want. In 1949, the Japanese government created a special class of vehicles called Keijidosha, with two goals. One, to help bolster the reeling post-war economy, and two, to help get cars into the population's hands. The idea was to encourage motorcycle manufacturers, like Honda, to use spare parts to construct ultra-inexpensive three- and four-wheeled motorized vehicles. The engines needed to be motorcycle-sized, under 150 cc, and while the cars had to be tiny, the tax advantages to buyers were huge. Didn't work. Not until almost a decade later when those engine and size limits had been significantly expanded. One car company finally figured out how to make an inexpensive, desirable K car with mass appeal. That was the Subaru 360. The 360 sparked the market, and Japan saw a 30-year run of trucks, vans, pickups, and every other body style imaginable, all in miniaturized form. By the late 1980s, though, the Japanese economy was roaring, and so the K cars got left behind. Even though they could now have 550cc engines, that just wasn't enough for the me, me, me generation. So beginning 1990, K cars were allowed once again to expand in size, but also to get a big bump in displacement, which meant they could now have engines big enough for air conditioning. That's where the party got started. The first to arrive was the 1991 Honda Beat. The other mid-engined 8500 RPM, 40 millimeter shift throw manual transmission two-seat Honda designed by Pininfarina. Like the NSX that dropped around the same time, the Beat was personally signed off by Soichiro Honda. It would be the last car he approved as he passed away less than three months after its reveal. The Beat was the world's first fully open mid-engine monocoque production car. It was also the first mid-engine K car and the first to get side impact door beams, an airbag, and four-wheel disc brakes. But of course, the first thing you're noticing is this outrageously cool zebra fabric. But that's not the most significant part of the Beat's cabin. That's that it's asymmetrical. The driver's side is a full inch wider than the passenger side, which means even big people like me can fit. And it suffers from none of the typical mid-engine car crooked driving position crap. No, it's perfect. This is your typical everyday Honda packaging miracle. It had a trunk and a frunk, standard air and power windows. The star of the beat though is, and always was, the engine. 
Three cylinders displacing a total of 656 cc's, each breathing through its own 36 millimeter throttle body and using a fuel injection strategy that Honda derived for its Formula One cars. It uses one set of inputs at idle and another under load, all in the name of just one thing, response. Look, it even says it right there, multi-throttle responsive engine control. And the Beat's goal, according to Honda's own documentation, was to be unreasonably fun. And so that 8,500 RPM lunatic that you can't even see totally dominates the driving experience with some of the nastiest, filthiest, dirtiest, most outspoken engine noises this side of a Porsche 911 GT3 RS. And I mean that. There's no VTEC here, so peak torque doesn't happen until 7,000 RPM, and then peak power comes in at 8,100. All 64 metric horsepower, the Beat is the most powerful naturally aspirated K car ever made, and the only one to ever hit the 64 horsepower limit. There is no legal limit. Tell your friends, I don't care what you read on Wikipedia. There is no legal limit to the amount of horsepower that a K car can make. There is only a gentleman's agreement among the members of the Japanese Automobile Manufacturers Association, whereby they all pledged that they wouldn't make an engine that makes more than 64 horsepower. That's it. Oh, and also, 64 wasn't chosen arbitrarily. This is another one of those chicken and the egg <laughs> things. See, 64 was chosen because there was already an engine in production that made 64 horsepower. In production by Suzuki. In 1987, Suzuki had introduced the Alto Works, a hot hatch with a 543cc turbocharged double overhead cam, four valve per cylinder triple that made, you guessed it, 64 horsepower. The addition of that turbocharger and all them cams and valves made JAMA worry that there was a horsepower war brewing. They were not wrong. JAMA has no legal authority in the same way that the SAE doesn't here, but regulates how horsepower is measured and then advertised. And what happened was JAMA said to its members, guys, we just hit 64 horsepower. Can we all agree that's enough? And they did. For the record, JAMA members also agreed to the 280 horsepower max for regular cars, a number chosen because the most powerful car sold in Japan was the Nissan Fairlady Z, which made, you guessed it, 280 horsepower. When the K-car regulations expanded in 1990 to allow more displacement, Suzuki punched out that motor to 657 cc's, still rated at 64 horsepower, turned it around 90 degrees and mounted it longitudinally in the front of a front-engined rear-wheel drive Austin Healey for the 1990s called the Suzuki <laughs> Cappuccino. Hmm. This is a latte. Released just six months after the Honda, the Cappuccino was the first K car to use double wishbone and multi-link suspension. And it was the first front mid layout with that engine fully behind the front axle. It was also available with a Torsen limited slip diff and anti-lock brakes. This is serious sports car stuff. And the Cappuccino had serious sports car speed. Suzuki claimed zero to 60 in the eights, which makes it five seconds quicker than the Honda Beat. The best part about a gentleman's agreement is that there is no such thing as a gentleman, especially when turbos are involved. The Cappuccino made one and a half times as much torque as the Honda did at first. And then Suzuki put an all new engine in the Cappuccino late in its life and it made twice as much torque as the Honda. Then the same 64 horsepower. The Cappuccino looks and drives like a Miata that was shrunken down to half size and then left with an air hose attached for a little too long. But it has the proportions of a traditional sports car with the driver barely in front of the rear axle. Its top is super cool, using removable hard top panels made of aluminium. And depending on which ones you removed, it could be a closed coupe, a T-top coupe, a Targa, or a full convertible. As a classically designed front engine rear wheel drive sports car with a genuinely lovely interior, it's no surprise the Cappuccino was as popular as it was, selling almost as many units as the Beat. But what's ironic is that Suzuki's first development of its K sports car started with the engine in the middle, not up front. 
back there, like Honda. Way back in 1985, Suzuki had shown the mid-engined RS1 concept. Two years later, it followed up with a similar RS3. And though Suzuki abandoned that car in favor of the front-engined cappuccino, that mid-engined RS car did make it into production as the AutoZam AZ1. It's ironic that the last of the trio to go on sale was actually the first to start development as that Suzuki RS1. And looking at the timeline, it's easy to see how the RS1 and RS3 could have actually been what got Honda thinking about making a mid-engine K-car in the first place, which would mean that the last of the bunch actually inspired the first of the bunch. Or in other words, the chicken hatched and became an egg. By the way, who the hell is AutoZam? In the very late 1980s, Mazda decided it would split its products into five different brands, much like GM had been doing with Chevy, Pontiac, Buick, Oldsmobile, and Cadillac. AutoZam brand would concentrate on rebadged Lanchas and also on Mazda's K cars, most of which were rebadged Suzuki's. When Mazda found out about Suzuki's plans to walk away from the mid-engine car, Mazda asked them to please continue development and installed a bunch of the team members who had just finished working on that unbelievably legendary NA Miata. First order of business was to graft Mazda's styling onto Suzuki's engineering. At the 1989 Tokyo Motor Show, Mazda showed three concepts, all called AZ550 Sports, named after the then-current 550cc engine max. Type A was a friendly city runabout. Type B was a super lightweight sports car. Type C was a Le Mans-inspired endurance racer. Mazda asked the public which it liked best and the vote was overwhelmingly for Type C. And Mazda ignored them in favor of Type A because that would be more commercially viable. Fair enough. The production car lost the pop-up headlights and the aluminum frame, but it kept the removable panels made out of fiberglass that made up this car's outrageous body. If the engine is the centerpiece of the beat and the classic sports car recipe is the headline for the cappuccino, it's the body that defines the AZ1. It's a mashup of the greatest hits of the supercar world, starting of course with the 300 SL style gullwing doors, and then onto the Ferrari F40-esque rear spoiler the Lamborghini Countach-ish windows, the McLaren F1-like taillights, the Testarossa-inspired strakes, and discount Ford RS200 headlights and air scoop. Add to that the driving position of a Bugatti EB110, which means it's completely crooked, but because this car is half the size, I'm stuck. Also, there's no frunk, and there's no trunk, and there would be storage on the shelf behind me, except there's a spare tire there, which is a little weird because Hold on, come with me. Back here is a spot for the spare tire. Problem was, in crashes, the spare tire pushed the steering column towards the driver. So AutoZam sent out a carrying pouch and asked owners to relocate the spare tire to the rear parcel shelf. Safety first. Speaking of safety, apparently these little guys have a reputation back at home because there's a lot of camber change over the suspension's travel, especially at the rear. And that means snap oversteer, and that means rollovers. And that's especially troubling in a car with gullwing doors that you can't open when you're on the roof. Oh well, these are inexpensive cars. You're gonna have to sacrifice something, even if that something is you. That's harsh. Can I say that? We're an insurance company. I hit my head and hurt myself. Get me out of this car. Ow! <laughs> anyway, the AZ-1 was built by Suzuki for Mazda. And though Mazda pushed the project along, the bulk of the engineering was done by Suzuki. And so the AZ-1 used the same two Suzuki engines that the Cappuccino had, turned back 90 degrees to their original transverse layout, and with the strongest 64 horsepower this side of 128 horsepower. That's a little monster. This thing is genuinely quick. But the AutoZam AZ-1 was a marketplace failure. They sold just 4,392 of them, plus 531 identical Suzuki Caras. Meaning, the other two cars each outsold the AutoZam six to one. 
And the reason for that wasn't just the cramped interior or the sketchy handling. It was because the boom economy that had created these little party animals had bust by the time the AZ-1 finally hit dealerships. Coolest guy at the party, but he got there after the cops had shut it down. How ironic that the mid-engine Suzuki that sparked the idea of a K-sports car would ultimately become a victim of its own tardy timing. And it wasn't even that late. It was only a year after the cappuccino and a year and a half after the Beat. But by that point, Honda had already sold two thirds of the Beats it would ever produce. This was a very short party. By some measures, Japan's recession lasted 25 years. And although that meant the end of those legends, all of that economic downtime continued to fuel the popularity of the K-Car. Though in the form of practical little boxes that were inexpensive to buy, put on the road, ensure, maintain, and fuel. And today, 40% of the cars on the road in Japan are K cars, just like half the cars on our roads are SUVs. Both of those categories of vehicles exist because a government decided they would be advantageous. And when an economic boom period collided head on with legislation that had been designed to mobilize the economically disadvantaged, well, <laughs> the craziest little thing happened. Three times. Oh, hi, I didn't see you standing there. But since you're there, let me ask you a question. Do you know about Ask Haggerty? That's a service that we offer to Haggerty Drivers Club members where you can call in and ask anything. That's also the only way. Hold on, there's a caller right now. Thank you for calling Ask Haggerty. This is Jason, how can I help you? The red line on that engine is 7,200 RPM. You're welcome. As I was saying, the Haggerty Drivers Club is the only way that you can get our award-winning Drivers Club. Hold on one second. Thank you for calling Ask Haggerty. This is Jason. How can I help you? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, a very strange tire size indeed. 205 55 15. Mm -hmm. You're welcome, Mom. Uh, see you for dinner? Mm -hmm. Okay, love you. Bye. Anyway, as I was saying, that's how you get the magazine. Hold on one second. And there's a li Thank you for calling Ask Haggerty. This is Jason. How can I help you? Ew, no, not ask anything. It's the only way for you to, to, to get the magazine and stuff. So there's, oh my God, there's a link that's above here somewhere floating on the thing you can click on and I get credit for it. It's probably in the description too. Hold on. Thank you for calling Ask Haggerty, please hold. Thank you for calling Ask Haggerty, please hold. Thank you for calling Ask Haggerty, please hold. Hello and thank you for calling Haggerty and Ask Haggerty and Haggerty Drivers Club. If you know your party's extension, please dial it after the tone. Para continuar en español, o prime el ocho. Anyway, there's also other cool stuff for HDC membership, including free advertising in our, in our classified ads, and uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you for holding, how can I help you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm single. Mm -hmm. Call me on my personal line after, uh, um, yeah, filming right now, thanks, bye. Thank you for holding. Fired, you're fired. 